Um, uh, William, the floor is all yours. Feel free to share your screen, introduce yourself, and start with your presentation. Thanks, Sean. Thanks, everybody, for joining us. I'm going to go ahead and share my uh, presentation using the Teams PowerPoint Live feature. So I'm actually not sharing my screen. I'm sharing a PowerPoint through Teams. You might find this a handy option in broadband limited areas because what it's actually doing right now is it's downloading um, the PowerPoint presentation to your Teams client, and then it's just going to respond to commands from me to advance the slides, and it's going to do so in a much uh, high. It looks much better, like the frame rate of the animations and the transitions looks a lot better, but it uses 90% less bandwidth. And so if you have issues sharing your video and your audio and your screen, this is a solution to that inside Teams. So welcome to everybody. Um, this is become a contributor to Microsoft Docs as Code in italics in GitHub. I'm going to explain what Docs as Code is and what we do. This presentation is for everybody, by the way. It's not just for SQL DBAs or anything like that. This is um, for all Microsoft documentation, anything Azure, anything SQL, anything data platform, anything .NET, anything, again, anything Microsoft really in our docs. So it's today's agenda. I'm going to introduce the topic of DevRel. I'm going to cover some tips and tricks in Microsoft Docs that you might not be aware of. We're not going to spend too much time on that. Most importantly, we're going to talk about how to contribute to Microsoft's open source Docs as Code in GitHub and what you need to do to become a contributor to the Docs. Uh, first thing you need to know is you'll need a GitHub.com account if you don't have one already. Then you can get involved. You can give feedback. If you find them, you can give corrections, edits to the docs that the entire community uses. You can find this rewarding for your career. Show your coworkers, impress your boss. Uh, you can put this on your MVP activity report. If you're a Microsoft MVP looking for, um, you've been nominated, you're looking for a renewal. This could be good for your personal brand. It's good stuff for your blog and so forth. Now, throughout the presentation, by the way, this could be very informal. I notice we don't have a chat feature right now, probably because just the way the Teams meeting was uh, set up and how people were invited. So don't worry about the chat. If you have any uh, questions, I'll have plenty of time at the end. You can come off a of mute and feel free to ask your questions. I'll also have some breaks in the middle and I'll, I'll ask for questions. And again, feel free to come off a of mute at that time. All right. So. On the SQL Docs team internally at Microsoft, we're affectionately known as Rogue One. It's a Star Wars reference. Um, our boss's boss is a big Star Wars nerd. Um, but when we're not violating multiple copyright laws with that nickname, we support tens of thousands of articles on SQL Server. And we work with the product groups and the program managers for everything SQL, including all its various flavors in Azure, as well as Azure Synapse Analytics and all the technologies under that umbrella. We also cover uh, content for the data platforms tooling like Management Studio and Azure Data Studio. But we are just one content team. And today we're talking about all of Microsoft Docs for all technologies. Again, my name is William Asif. I've actually been with Microsoft for about a year. I'm on the Microsoft SQL Docs team, and my responsibilities are over SQL performance, um, a lot of Azure SQL database topics, big data clusters, and Azure Synapse analytics. Uh, oh, and before that, I was a consulting DBA for a long time, and a, as uh, John mentioned, I was a speaker and a blogger, and I ran the SQL Saturday in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, and if any of you were ever there, I probably met you there. Uh, but now I live in Redmond, so. Uh, a bit about the mission statement of the hundreds of employees of content and learning at Microsoft. Look, and real, real short, we have two missions. One, we want to enable students, job seekers, workers online with comprehensive trusted content experiences. And two, to build an active community of contributors. Well, that second goal is why we're doing this presentation. We want to communicate specifically how you can be a part of the quality Microsoft Docs experience. Now, Microsoft Docs are not Wikipedia. It's not open to all edits, but we do have hundreds of thousands of articles, and we want to embrace the wisdom of you in the technical user community to maintain a high level of quality. Opening the docs up to external contributors, then, is how we scale. 
So uh, the SQL Docs team is one of many Docs teams for many different products in Microsoft's cloud and AI DevRel team. So yes, somebody took a took control. All right, <laughs> it's okay. I'll get it started again. Yeah, so that's the other thing about the PowerPoint uh, live feature that if you're presenting as a team, then any one of you can uh, grab control and start uh, advancing the slides as you want. Like if you're if you're presenting on a team, you don't have to like tell the other person to advance the slides if they're sharing it. You can actually just share it. Uh, all right, back on track. So what is what is DevRel? Developer relations. Uh, let me talk a little bit about that and, and how our team fits into that. So in a greater role, developer relations is the team that involves connecting developers and in-house manufactured goods to the external users. So you in the community. So DevRel ensures that products establish a good continuous relationship with external developers through that mutual communication. Communication both ways, right? So it definitely involves documentation, but also like reference of how to reference and call an API and code samples and things like that. Learn content, training, quick starts, how to's. Uh, DevRel in other companies might look like community management, issue reporting and triage, uh, release notes, focus groups, even public interaction like that. Your favorite video game, for example, has DevRel folks to send and receive communication with the public about bugs, uh, troubleshooting, patch notes, discussions, and, and mods, things like that. So some tech companies will cycle developers in and out of DevRel positions so that DevRel folks have a keen awareness of that technical detail from being a developer, but also so that developers see how the end user consumes the products and consumes the documentation. So in a way, DevRel is not marketing to CIOs and CEOs. It's marketing to developers, technical folks like you. There are products out there that we all use and we continue to use them because we had good documentation experiences and support experiences or because of an easy adoption or learning curve. Well, that's DevRel. So in that uh, authentic community involvement spirit, uh, let's dive in. So I want to talk a little bit about docs just to give you a map around like the modern docs.microsoft.com website. I'm not going to talk about every feature and every button, but let me talk about some features that we've added new recently uh, that you might find very helpful. We have a save button now that allows you to save links of docs to collections to organize docs into groups so that you might um, use for a specific project or a certification exam. You can then save docs to a collection alongside Microsoft Learn modules and Q&A pages to gather all the materials that you needed in one place. You see two search boxes on every doc. The first is at the top right hand, and it searches the entire technology stack you're in. For example, it'll search all of Azure. And then on the left hand side, uh, you'll see a table of contents and a search box over that where you can search the titles in the table of contents. And sometimes that's easier to search by titles. Um, that table of contents on the left covers many different articles. And on the right, you'll see a navigation for the article itself. And those article headers, those links to each article's header are linkable directly. If you hover over any heading, you'll see a little link icon or you can just click on the link icon or right click on the link icon and you'll notice that the url has the anchor appended uh, that way you could send a link specifically to a portion of a doc to a colleague or something like that where it makes sense the same doc might include different information for different versions of the product that you've mentioned uh, we may use the same article with various versions of content for for example windows versus linux or for different versions of SQL Server or different Azure implementations of SQL Server. This one on the bottom left hand corner, for example, is a code snippet of Markdown showing how one article might display different content depending on the version that's requested. Well, how do you know what version of a document you've requested? It's on the left hand side. If a doc doesn't look quite right because of like a version specific detail, um, that that drop down list in the top left hand corner could come in handy. The version drop down list also affects the table of contents. 
So when you change a version from SQL 17 to 19, or for example, it could affect the table of contents by including or excluding certain articles. Sometimes we'll handle versioning via tabs within the document that show like how to do the same thing in PowerShell versus the Azure CLI uh, or an API or code or something like that. Or we'll clearly state the versions in the applies to row at the top of the article with green check marks. Or we'll use colorful note boxes throughout the doc to make sure that you know what SQL platform or version that the content applies to. Also note that for content that's specific to old versions of SQL Server, before SQL 2016, for example, we do still have ways to access that old content, even if some of those ways are through offline docs only, and we'll talk about that. And while we support content for all supported versions of SQL Server, just a friendly reminder that SQL 2012 goes out of support next summer in less than a year. So if you're still running SQL 2012, or boy, if you're still running uh, SQL 2008 or 2008 R2, uh, it is time to get that upgrade plan in place. Uh, SQL 2012 goes out of support in July of next year. So speaking of Management Studio, and this is a SQL crowd or a data crowd, if you still use, if you use Management Studio, and actually if you use any uh, version of Visual Studio, so SQL Server Management Studio, SQL Server Data Tools, or just Visual Studio straight up, this works in all of those. If you hit F1, on any text that you have highlighted, it should bring you right to the corresponding article for that syntax or that word that you highlighted. So for example, here, the uh, dynamic management view DM exec sessions. This assumes that your workstation, of course, has access to the internet and that you have selected the help preference for open in browser. This will bring you straight to the Microsoft Docs article. Uh, if you hit F1, on something that's highlighted and it doesn't bring you to the specific article that you thought it should, or it brings you to a different article or it just brings you to like a landing page or something, that actually might be a docs issue. And that's something you could file a GitHub issue for and we'll walk through how to do that in a little bit. If your work environment is behind an air-gapped network, or if you work in a security environment that does not allow you access to the internet, like a, a nuclear power plant or something like that, you can download version specific docs for offline use through Visual Studio, or in this case, through Management Studio. In fact, uh, for some older content, um, for example, the T-SQL reference documentation that's specific to 2014, this is the only way to get that content. So our documentation is actually a strategic advantage for Microsoft. Uh, we, we feel pretty strongly about this. There's some pretty large organizations out there in the public sector and in the private sector, at the top of the fortune list, for example, that want their development environments internal and secured away from the public internet. So in the case of Microsoft documentation for SQL Server, Power BI, and Azure, Windows Server, Windows, all this kind of stuff, um, all that is hosted in GitHub. Therefore, it can be easily cloned, uh, brought offline and into that secure network uh, so that the customers can get the best of both worlds, secure network for development and access to fresh documentation. Some of our competitors want to like give a, a whole bunch of PDFs or like a, a few thousand scraped website images, stuff like that. I mean, come on, this is much better. Okay, so any questions at this point before we move on? about docs, about DevRel, about the team. All right, plenty to cover, so let's keep rolling. So how do you contribute to docs? Uh, for documentation issues, you have two options. So you have GitHub issues, GitHub pull requests, and both of these operate just the same as if you were contributing to any other open source project. If you're a developer and you've contributed to an open source project on GitHub, same deal. Right, you have the same options. And contributing can be done easily through the browser. I know this is a data crowd, so we don't always live in Git and GitHub and Git Bash and things like that. And we don't always live within source control for a lot of our work. I was a DBA for a long time. I don't always live in source control for everything that I do. So that, not, that, that workflow might not be super familiar to me. That's okay. Contributing can be done easily through the browser without having to learn Git Bash or install anything. You don't have to know what a fork, a clone, a push, or a pull is. Uh, we'll have an explainer later on how that process works if you're unfamiliar. 
if you do work in Git and GitHub and you're familiar with pull requests and how to set up a remote repository, for example, you can do that. And later we'll talk about how this process works behind the scenes. But in the case of SQL Docs, again, a lot of DBAs like me, they're not super familiar with Git, GitHub. Not a problem. Anyone can help easily using the browser only. We even have a step-by-step -step tutorial at this URL right here to guide you through the process of creating a pull request, for example. So docs.microsoft.com slash contribute. And by contributing to Microsoft Docs for any product or technology, you can be part of the community and help edit the docs that everyone uses. We'll talk about the contributor doc designation at the top of an article. We average around 16 million page views a month that people would see your GitHub icon on. And you can do this entirely within the browser if you want. Again, with nothing to install. And you're about to get an inside sneak peek at the process behind Microsoft's Docs as Code approach. The content teams that we're talking about, the content team that I'm on, we work with the product teams, we work with the program managers, and we integrate with their development life cycles. We join their support reviews and their team meetings, and we coordinate on release schedules. So we release the docs just like we release the products. So all that said, let's walk through it. So what's a bug? To be clear, support issues don't belong in doc feedback. The, the feedback options that I'm talking about today, the Git issues and Git pull requests, these are not Microsoft support, and there's no SLA for response time at all. We have goals for SLA, but we'll be honest. I mean, sometimes these things take days or weeks to address. If you're having a problem or an unexpected behavior or an outage, definitely contact Microsoft support or your support partner. We're going to triage the incoming issues and the pull requests in GitHub. And if it sounds like a support issue, your issue will likely be closed up with a polite message and some links to contact support or something like that. Most docs issues that get attention are a request to fix something that's missing or outdated or wrong, a request to add something that would have helped prevent an error or an outage. So after you've resolved your issue and you, you find a preventative, yeah, maybe that belongs in the docs as well. And that's something that you could add. So uh, let's say that you've got a documentation issue to suggest. Think of this as just letting us know. Hey, here's a problem. You go fix it, Microsoft. We have goals to address these in a timely manner, but again, these issues are triaged and they might take weeks before there's a satisfactory resolution. Usually they're wrapped up pretty quickly though. Not all issues will become a documentation change though. So to create an issue, you can use the this page button at the bottom of a page uh, for where, where it's enabled. It's not enabled on every page, but most pages will have this, this page button. That'll bring you to the GitHub new issue screen. Now you're not in docs.microsoft.com anymore. You're actually in github.com. This is a new issue screen. Throw your comments in here, give it a title, hit submit new issue, and we'll take it from there. It's that easy. And if you weren't aware, by the way, GitHub has a dark mode. It's very nice. I'm not sure how many of you prefer to work in dark themed apps and websites as much as you can, but I know I do. Um, a couple ways to change your theme in GitHub in your accounts settings on the appearance menu. Uh, you can also set it to sync automatically with Chrome or Windows to have your appearance setting uh, automatically change for night and day. That's very cool. I just turned it to night theme all day long. Uh, also, if you're an enthusiast for dark mode websites like I am, docs.microsoft.com is a dark theme too. You can check out the footer in any docs website to change your theme from light to dark. Also, dark mode has arrived in the latest build of Microsoft Word, which is pretty awesome. And I hear that it's coming soon to LinkedIn as well. So I'm looking forward to that. All right, enough about dark mode, dark theme websites. Back to contributing. So second option, you want, uh, you've got a documentation issue and you wanna actually suggest the edits yourself. A lot of times this is easier because sometimes describing that like, hey, in the third paragraph in the second sentence, there's a period that should be here. You know, a lot of times it's just easier to go and make the change yourself, especially for like a, a punctuation issue like that or something. So in that case, on any doc, you should be able to hit the, uh, on most docs rather, you should be able to hit the edit button in the top right hand corner. That'll bring you again to github.com. Now you're looking at the GitHub preview page for the markdown of that article. 
One more click from here, click the pencil button in the top right hand header bar, the thing that I have boxed in red right there. Hit the pencil button, and now you're looking at the actual markdown code in a text edit box in the browser. It might surprise you to learn that Microsoft Docs are not edited in Microsoft Word, <laughs> but rather they're edited in code in Markdown here or in YAML. Markdown is a lightweight text markup language that's created for formatting rich text with a plain text editor. GitHub has their own formal implementation of Markdown called GitHub Flavored Markdown. Many different online sites use Markdown for their content, including GitHub, GitLab, but also like Reddit, Stack Exchange, Bitbucket, Drupal, a lot more. So you might already be more familiar with Markdown than you think. Make your changes here in the text box. Again, if you're not familiar with Markdown, it's pretty easy to understand once you get rolling. Um, don't worry about the formatting being perfect, the style being perfect or anything like that. The content team, somebody on a team like mine, will always review your content submission and potentially tweak it to Microsoft standards before it is merged live. There are plenty of resources online for basic markdown syntax. If you don't get something quite right, don't sweat it. Uh, you can use the preview changes that I have boxed in red here to preview the markdown formatting. And then when you scroll to the bottom, once you've made your changes, uh, here you have a chance to commit your changes. Enter your pull request title, give it some comments. Uh, you can then use the hashtag ping MSFT docs. Just think of this as a way of waving hi to us, uh, letting us know you heard about us. Um, and you can use that same hashtag on Twitter or LinkedIn or anything to say hi. That's also a way that we can then recognize you on social media and thank you for your contribution. Because otherwise, when you submit something via GitHub, we don't really know who you are outside of your GitHub profile. Um, you can then choose to, uh, you hit the radio button to create a new branch for this commit. Uh, this is actually the only option that you have. Uh, unlike some open source code projects, we do not allow you to commit code directly to our live repository. Uh, you'll notice that it gives the branch name a simple name, just your username dash patch dash, then just an ordinal number. That's fine. You don't have to worry about changing that. If you're not familiar with GitHub terminology like branches, pull requests, don't worry. You don't have to be. Once you submit your changes to your pull requests and you hit the green commit changes button, we take it from there. We'll keep you updated as your pull request moves through the process. It's that simple. Your changes to the markdown file will be proposed for merge. They'll be triaged. They'll be reviewed by the article's author and reviewers. The content team for the article then takes it from there. We'll reply to the pull requests in comments, we'll make edits if necessary, and then we'll merge the code in. You'll be notified along the way with feedback directly from one of us on the content team. Again, you can do all of this if you want through your own tooling. You can, cre you can create your own fork, your own branch, your own commits, your own push and pull requests. That's what we on the content teams do every day with our own tooling. But if you just want to use github.com, use the website to handle the entire process for you, it's actually much easier. So here's what it looks like after you've submitted your pull request. Your pull request will start in an open status, but you can see this one's already merged. It's got that purple box at the top left hand corner. It means it's been accepted and it's been pushed into the repo. Uh, you can see what your GitHub has done for you here was to automatically in the background create a fork of the repository and then create a branch here in uh, the username. And then the pull request includes the commit with that red arrow right there. This is in the pull request log. That's the actual commit right there that contains the changes to the article. Now, pull requests can include many different commits for many different files. At the bottom here, you can um, you can add to the pull requests log. So the pull request log contains both automated and manually created messages. Automation for the merge engine, as you can see here, there's there's automation talking, there's people talking. It contains all the commits, all the conversation and the notes from anyone who's been assigned. You'll receive an email anytime anyone uses your username with the at symbol, and you can respond in conversation at the bottom here with the comment button. 
Once your pull request is created, both you and Microsoft can review the changes that you're suggesting in the pull request. So you can click on the Files Change tab that you see here boxed in red, and there you see an in-browser differential. Red is the old code, green is the new code, and the changed characters are highlighted. In this case, you can see it's a pretty simple typo fix. We're just moving the two asterisks around. Uh, two asterisks in Markdown makes the thing bold. In fact, you may find creating that pull request easier than creating the issue. Again, this is one of those scenarios we're trying to describe this uh, without seeing it. Describe this in a few sentences, like in the in this table, there's this row, and the and the two asterisk characters are in the wrong cell. Um, it might just be easier to do the pull request yourself than creating a Git issue. If you're trying to describe how something should change, simply making the change is oftentimes simpler and more accurate, right? If you still want to make more changes to the file, you can issue another commit to the same pull request. Simply click on those three dots and click Edit File again. Then you can submit another change. Let's say you spot another typo. And you can uh, submit another commit to the same open pull request. After you've submitted your pull request, though, you can sit back. We got it from here. Microsoft will let you know if we have any questions or if we have a status update. So there you have it. Now, what's most helpful to Microsoft? What gives you contribution credit? Only a pull request. That's what we want to see. After your pull request is in, you can say hi to us on Twitter or LinkedIn or any other social media so we can recognize you as a contributor there. Now, if you've contributed via a pull request and we merge your commit into the article, you'll get your GitHub picture and a link to your GitHub profile at the top of the article. The folks listed here are both inside and external to Microsoft that submitted commits to this article. You only get your name and your logo on an article for a pull request, though. You don't get this for an issue. And these contributions can be part of your MVP's application or your renewal activity. I am not in the MVP process. I was an MVP uh, before coming to Microsoft, but I am not in that process. So I'm, I'm not going to really speak more about the MVP process there, but I will say uh, with the MVP stuff and your activity, quality is more important than quantity. Um, if you have any questions about that, uh, I, I, I can try to answer if you'd like. OK, don't be afraid to submit a pull request. If you're not sure how it should change, just give it a shot. If you're not quite right, if it's not formatted perfectly, don't worry about it. We'll adjust that. We'll, we'll get the formatting and the styling right, but at least you've drawn attention to it. At least it gets fixed. For images or graphics that need to be updated, we have designers, we have artists to get the images updated in a standardized way. There's no need to edit images yourself. Um, it, capitalization. Uh, capitalization is tough in the SpongeBob font, right? We get it. The capitalization of various features and products inside Microsoft is one of the most nuanced bits there is about our doc publishing. Uh, marketing usually wins these. Marketing always wins these arguments. Uh, regardless of how products documentation has evolved throughout the development process before it becomes public. We just had a big pull request come through, for example, to make a lot of capitalization changes that were mostly misguided. So again, that task is tricky enough when you have information directly from the inside sources. So we can handle that part. If you spot inconsistencies, yes, between marketing content uh, and documentation and then learn content, for example, you should know we're regularly discussing and working on that stuff internally. Don't be afraid to point something out. Uh, for example, it's tricky. Product names and feature names and phrasing are difficult to get just right. And they're trickiest when a generic word is part of the product name. So just because we have a product called Azure SQL Database or Azure Firewall, doesn't mean that every word database or firewall is now capitalized. Same thing with managed instance. This is even most difficult when our international partners or customers get involved because capitalization often means that a product or service name shouldn't be translated or it should be translated, but in a specific way. But a lowercase common noun of the same term should be translated. Inconsistency and in capitalization confuses translators and customers, so that consistency is important. And it's part of our core goal 
uh, of our brand voice, which is above all to be simple and human. And if we can do better to meet that goal, let us know. So uh, a bit about localization issues, such as translation issues. So if you've got a translation issue to raise with an international version of a document, and you can change the language that your document is in at the bottom of the footer, docs.microsoft.com, of course, right? Um, those are actually all submitted. Those issues are submitted by email now, and there's a template here, aka.ms docsite lock feedback for localization feedback. Uh, this process is actually new and has changed in the last year. If you've done this before, you can download this Outlook email template here. Submit your feedback in any language. It will be translated and routed to the correct localization team. If you've got a technical issue with an article, and you're more comfortable submitting your issue in another language than English, no problem. Instead of creating an issue or pull request in English, you can use the same email template. It will be translated and then passed along to the proper content teams, like for example, my SQL Docs team. Either way, thanks for contributing and making Microsoft Docs better for everyone everywhere. Before I go much further, let me go ahead and pause. Any questions on any of that? on get issues, get pull requests, localization issues, anything like that. I do have a couple of questions, William. Thank you for very much for what you do and what Pamela Hood does. And uh, yeah, you guys just directed me. Uh, you just assigned Pam to me on a recent one, so that's cool. Uh, I got the Pam, if you know what I mean. That's right. Um, but you mentioned like, you know, two asterisks equals bold. Is there a listing somewhere of all the different features like, you know, do yeah. uh, three asterisks mean bold italic and one asterisk means italic? Is there a list of things we can get there? And very specifically, mm -hmm. is there something to identify a code block? Yes, so all that's actually very standard to GitHub uh, to, to Markdown in general. This has absolutely nothing to do with GitHub or Microsoft Docs at that point. This is all Markdown right. standard stuff. If you go to docs.microsoft.com slash contribute, there's yeah. going to be an article in there with the standard Markdown formatting. And yes, that's that's correct. Uh, the tick symbol is what you would use for an inline code, like for a database name or a table name or like a code snippet. And then the three tick symbol would be for a multi-line code block. Uh, and then you're going to want to. Uh, yeah, I mean, that, that that's basically it. But again, when you submit your pull request, you get your styling as right as you're comfortable getting it right. We'll handle that. The the core of your uh, of your PR. Don't don't worry about the styling and capitalization if you're trying to submit something that's a technical change. Oh, sure, understood. But the yeah. uh, code block is kind of essential, so uh, I very much yeah, appreciate totally. that. Yeah, totally. Um, so for a for a multi line code block, uh, give it its own line separated by line breaks. Put use the three tick symbol, and then the first of the three tick symbols, like the opening one, should have. If it's a SQL, if it's a T SQL syntax, right? So it would be tick, 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 SQL. And that styles and formats the code as uh, T SQL. OK, and we don't have to worry about, uh, you know, like I, I like to separate, uh, shall we say, paragraphs of code with a semicolon and a, and a space. Um, yep, you still do that. But, okay, and yeah. I don't have to worry about it automatically. <laughs> like some of these forms, my God, you write some beautiful code and it slams it into the left and it automatically double spaces everything. And I hate that. I just oh, want to be able well, to do the correct indentation with yeah. spaces. Ind indentation could be tricky there, but if it's inside the code block, whether you're using tabs or spaces, it, it shouldn't it shouldn't affect it. Uh, GitHub flavored markdown should handle that OK. OK, that's beautiful. Uh, Either way, if it doesn't go through correctly, we're going to still format it so that the code looks good and it's all lined up and justified, things like that. OK, you may change your standards after you see my formatting. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, and the other question is, mm -hmm. so far everything has been about editing pages. Yep. Um, how do you, you know, create if a I new have page. a suggestion for a new page? You know, like Bro. I have a killer presentation on what uh, what actually happens during page splits, for example, how can I recommend that as a possible change for or new page? Good, good question. Um, 
So I would find uh, that that's not something we make easy to do. When you add a new page, there's a lot of there's a few more steps behind the scenes that isn't easy as a member of the public to do to add it to the table of contents, for example. Um, so that part's difficult for us to automate for external contributors. What I would do if you have content like that is find a page where it seems appropriate. For example, in that case, uh, a page about uh, the DMV um, that maybe is core to the conversation or about storage or about performance or maintenance. You know, however you're really approaching page splits, I understand that could be a couple different ways. Um, and so without getting the details of that, like right now, I would find the article that is most appropriate to that and propose adding a section to that article. If we figure that, hey, this would be a best as a brand new article, we can just take your content, copy and paste it, do all the formatting and syntax and behind the scenes machinations to get a new article placed. The other possible areas for that content would be um, in a samples repository, and there's a bunch of them out there depending on what content that you're in. Um, in Azure samples or in SQL samples or things like that, there's a lot of Microsoft run repositories that are more run by the product teams themselves that might be open to a content addition like that. Or to learn modules. And so if you go to Microsoft Learn, there's a lot of content there and some of that can be sourced by external contributors and we can propose that and they have a whole process that's separate for that. And if you go to Microsoft Learn, there should be a lot more information on how to contribute there. But if you'd be interested in, for example, doing a learn module on page splits, I mean, it sounds kind of uh, really specific, but maybe a learn module on, uh, you know, maintenance or index maintenance or something like that, uh, fill factor uh, or index alignment, uh, those kind of things, they might be amenable to you developing a module like that. That would be um, a good addition, would have your name on it and would be something that it would be available and learn for everybody to do. So there's a lot of different ways that kind of content might get involved. Obviously, getting it involved in your blog is the first step there too. Sure, would uh, on such a thing, uh -huh. would it be simpler just to submit a Word document like you guys have at it? So, no, there's no way to submit a Word document like that. Uh, okay. No, I, I would. Um, I would still try to find if, if you wanted it to get into the docs and, and if it's styled in the right docs, right? Our docs are typically not like a narrative style. They're more of a reference style, right? Uh, more, more concepts rather than a uh, storytelling. I know like uh, whenever I'd write a blog, it's a different voice than I would write a technical document, right? right. So I would still try to find that, that right uh, doc. No, I don't, I don't think throwing us word docs is going to be something that would have a lot of success depending on like the team it lands in and things like that. Sure. Not just talking about SQL, but uh, no, I, I would definitely try to at least shoehorn it into an existing article and then kind of see where it surfaces. Uh, that team would then make decisions about what their content has, what their spread of articles covers that topic. So sure, it's, it's kind of difficult uh, to give you a, a specific and expected reaction from something like that. Totally yeah. understood. And I'm I'm just learning this stuff. So thank yeah, you. Great. Um, no, great. The link for Microsoft Learn is just docs.microsoft.com uh, slash learn or so a learn contributor. No, it's so learn.microsoft.com and then or uh, oh, I'm sorry, it's actually docs.microsoft.com slash learn. And then there's a contribute button at the bottom of that page at the very gotcha. bottom in the footer. And that would give you all that same information. It's actually the same link right here for learn and docs. OK. Outstanding. Thank you very much. I appreciate yeah, it. Yeah, Jeff, great questions. Good stuff. <laughs> All right. I'm, I'm glad we got those uh, questions and answers comments. Yeah, the, the, I, I get that answer frequently, especially from MVPs, like how do I submit a brand new article? You know, the, the estate that uh, our articles spread out on and like how we cover that kind of content is kind of a different conversation than than uh, how we generally accept the public feedback. So it's, it's a good question. Um, yeah, I mean, we can still use the content a variety of ways. Let's not focus maybe on whether or not it's a new article with somebody's name on it. Let's just focus on the content where it fits. Right. Anybody exactly. else? Yeah. And then great questions, Jeff. Uh, thank Anybody you, else have any questions before I move on? I only have a little bit left, so let's go ahead and finish out. Um, let's talk about how GitHub hosts Microsoft Docs. So now you've seen how you can use GitHub to contribute. I'm going to briefly show you the inside baseball 
talk about how we use GitHub to host Microsoft documentation. So uh, Microsoft Docs are edited in Markdown or YAML. We've already talked about that Markdown stuff and the styling again is, is very similar. GitHub flavored Markdown is a very standardized form of Markdown. So if you're used to using Markdown on any other platform, uh, Reddit, Stack Exchange, things like that, it's going to be very similar. Uh, YAML we use for some other documents. You might find YAML, for example, in a frequently asked questions article. So if you wanted to submit an update to one of those, uh, you're going to actually find that it should be in YAML. YAML is another plain text markup language used for structuring and serializing data. And you know you're working in YAML if you have to be hyper concerned about the amount of blank spaces before a character because indentation is absolutely critical to how YAML works. It's infuriating. I agree. Uh, I prefer Markdown for a lot of these cases, but that's that's what YAML is. Uh, we spend a lot of time using uh, internally. We use Visual Studio Code actually to write the docs, uh, or Azure Data Studio, which is based on Visual Studio Code. That's actually the tools that we use all day long. We have other tools to help with things like automated link checking, syntax formatting, bulk updates, a series of include files as well internally to tokenize things like product names that the docs engine then substitutes in place. We have a rich set of metadata for each article, and we do pay attention to how an article performs in terms of search engine optimization, traffic patterns, trends. All this is collected and driven through Azure Analytics and Custo queries. And we try to improve poorly performing articles. And so what, what defines an article's performance? Well, that includes, for example, if you copy text from an article, or if you use the try this button or the copy button on a code sample, on a code block, that's great. We'd love to see that. If you click through how you scroll, how you dwell, you know, the same kind of metrics that any website uses these days to measure the how effective a web page is, all without capturing any personal information or wider tracking information, of course. For big article updates, we have other tools to handle um, things like we use a release branch. For example, when we want to work on documentation for months and months at a time and then release it all at once when a product is announced at the keynote of a big conference, for example. And so we have other tools to work on documentation like that. So here's some specifics behind the scenes of how Microsoft Docs in Git works, specifically in GitHub, where all Microsoft documentation is managed. Again, if you are new to Git and GitHub and you don't understand this, don't worry about it. As I've already explained, to be a contributor to the community, all this is managed for you and you don't have to download or install anything. But if you're interested, or if you already know about this and you're, you wanna learn more, here's the basic GitHub workflow. And now let's apply it to docs. So a repository like Azure Docs or SQL Docs or whatever repository your article happens to be in, that's where the source is housed. And that's where the website engine pulls Markdown to present the live pictures to you on the website. A fork is a copy of the repository that's associated to your account up in GitHub. And we each have created forks of each repo in our GitHub accounts. Now, to tell those two apart, a common convention is to reference your, your remote fork as origin and the code base you eventually push to as upstream. And these are just, uh, these are called remote names or remotes, and these are just common naming conventions. You can actually choose any name for your remotes, but you will have an origin and an upstream for each repository that you work in. A clone then is a copy of a fork brought down locally and the files are copied to your workstation. They're, they're physically created on your workstation when you clone a repository so that you can make edits to those files so that you can add and remove files. And now when you go to make changes to a file or you add or remove files, you're gonna do that inside what's called a working branch. And that is relevant to the chunk of changes that you'll be making. And you want a branch to contain only the changes specific to a feature or an issue or like a specific fix that you're addressing so that it can be treated as a block of changes atomically as it goes back up the chain and it's not going to be held up by you know unrelated changes or anything like that so at any given time you might have several different branches in your uh, working 
local clone. So your work goes into the branch, and in this case, it's called uh, fix issue, and it's the ISO date appended to the front. Uh, that's can be handy. GitHub doesn't always show you the full date, so putting the date in the branch is sometimes handy. When you're done, first you commit the branch locally to the clone on your own workstation. At this point, you have committed your work, but it's only on your workstation, your laptop, right? It's not in the cloud. Microsoft has no idea of any changes that you have made. Then you will push your branch and all the commits for it to your origin in GitHub, in github.com. So now your code changes are in GitHub. They are associated with the fork of the code in your GitHub account. They are in the cloud. They are off of your workstation. Microsoft still has no idea of the changes that you've made, right? To do that, you need a pull request. Now you are asking Microsoft Docs that repository uh, and that repository's uh, repo, Azure Docs, to accept commits from your repository's branch so that your changes can be merged from your fork into the main repository. Now, that was a simplified version to explain things a little closer to the reality of how we work internally. We actually have two repositories in the Microsoft Docs account. The Azure Docs repository is what actually drives the website, what's live. But like true professionals, we do not develop against production. We only develop in the preview repository, so that dash PR repository, which is not visible to the public and which allows us to work in and preview the merged state of our changes in the actual live repository. This build process then to the live website occurs usually twice a day. It's gated by a team of build reviewers. So internally we work in this private thing, but that's not visible to the public. When you submit pull requests, you don't have to worry about this. All your workflow and all the validation necessary for public pull requests occurs inside the public Azure Docs repo or SQL Docs repo. And again, this same Docs as code pattern applies to all Microsoft technologies, all the Microsoft repositories in Microsoft Docs. So are there any questions about this, about how this works? If you have any uh, interest in learning more about Git or GitHub, we have a lot of really good resources on learn about Git and GitHub and how you can apply that to your work and how you do your job. Any questions? I do have some additional questions that Go ahead, Jeff. Uh, just have to do with this latest part, because like you said, I'm going to ignore that latest part and let you guys handle that because that's easy for us slob DBAs, if you know what I mean. <clears throat> but I do have a question on uh, if I feel that some pictures are appropriate for uh, inclusion, uh, can those easily be included in this markup language as well? I don't. I don't think that, I mean, yes, you can put pictures in markup and the, the syntax is pretty standard there as well. There's nothing special about it. Um, I don't know if we accept image uh, attachments from the public for those kind of things. You could either rehost that and provide us a link in the comments of your pull request and say, hey, here's an example of a picture you could use. Either way, we would probably not accept your picture as is. We would run it through our own artists so that sure. it's standardized and that it runs through legal and all sorts of things like that. Uh, you could definitely provide a link to an image that, hey, it could look something like this if you'd like. Okay, and the reason why I ask is because I have this special thing that I've created called index DNA that actually shows um, the page density of every page in a particular index so that you can see what the fragmentation actually looks like at a page density level. And uh, I, one picture is worth a thousand words there. And yeah. I, uh, uh, you know, if I need to, I can actually give you the code to, and the spreadsheet that pretty produces the picture. Right. And so maybe so, in your Maybe in the comments of the PR, you could suggest like including a screenshot of the of the results or something like that. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Yeah. Good. Good yeah. question. Thank you for your time. This is uh, yeah. This is great because I stumbled around the first time and you helped me out a little bit and. Uh, oh, good. 
you actually ran through and did a, a, a commit for me and I've got some uh, some pretty good changes and that's right in that you still have in, something pending I think after all that yeah and I got to get back to that that was I forget what the hell it was on but <clears throat> all right on this well, uh, yeah, let me let me finish up and then I'll I'll open it back up to the rest of the uh, okay. rest of the crowd for stuff like that. I want to make sure I wrap up on time. Absolutely. Uh, good stuff though. So let me let me uh, go over a few more slides. So what's what's new? What's recently? What's upcoming? Uh, in February of this year, we introduced some new dynamic recommended content in the footer of many Microsoft Docs articles. And in fact, SQL Docs was one of the first repositories to get this uh, new feature. And so the links in the uh, recommended content of many Microsoft Docs articles here are determined by a machine learning solution based on a model that describes how customers move through the documentation set. So we've seen really positive metrics on tracking traffic to these recommended articles so far. So we actually think this is helping people find what they need. And you'll find this at the very bottom of a lot of articles now. Uh, also new to Docs, and this is new just of this summer, you can add certifications to your login uh, to docs.microsoft.com by permanently connecting your certification profile from Microsoft Learn. So you can go to your profile in Learn or in Docs to get here. You go to certifications in your profile, and then click on connect in the uh, certifications button right there. And you can then get notifications for your certifications, renewals, for example, and a lot more. And you can link directly to Pearson View to schedule any kind of certification exams that you're pursuing. Uh, that's brand new. And that's something that you could uh, enable on your account. And then a couple upcoming events. Microsoft Ignite 2021 is uh, November. More information about that is going to be coming soon about how to register for that and things like that. And then, of course, the new Pass Data Community Summit, which is now run by Redgate, is the next week in November 8th to the 12th. You'll see me there giving a presentation actually very similar to this. And PassDataCommunitySummit.com is where to go for that. Now, great stuff. I think I'm finishing right on time. Uh, we got about seven minutes before the top of the hour. Thank you very much, uh, Jean, for hosting. It's been a fantastic group. Uh, thanks for building this brand new community. I love to see these new data communities popping up, uh, you know, especially with what happened to pass and everything like that. I love seeing these organic communities pop up, especially the ones that are virtual and for everybody. Uh, open to questions now. Yep, you are very welcome, and it's an honor to have you here. By the way, this is an outstanding presentation. Thanks. <laughs> Every time when I watch this, I learn something new. <laughs> You're good. Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, if you guys have any question, you do have access to unmute yourself. Feel free to uh, do that and raise, raise your hand as well. Yeah, I don't see a chat. I don't know if it's, if the chat has popped up for anybody else, but uh, I haven't seen that there's any questions in there. Yeah, um, uh, the thing is I disabled the chat this yeah. way. Uh, they can have uh, direct interaction with you. You know, no, sometimes. Yeah, uh, but if you want, I can enable it if you want. Yeah, don't worry about it. Feel free to come yeah. off of mute if you have any questions. Marcy? Yes. I'd like to say that this was wonderful. I'm very inspired. I'm looking forward to trying to do this to as yeah, I great. develop myself. I wanted to find out if these slides and the recording are being available to us. Yes, I will send the slides to John. I think he hit record before, so we should be able to get these hosted on the uh, on your website, right, John? Yeah, correct. And where would that be? I will share it with you. We do have uh, our YouTube channel. Um, uh, can I share my screen for this again? Yeah, go ahead, bud. Okay, perfect. Thank you, William. Are you able to see my screen or it's loading? Not yet. Are you able to see my screen? Not yet. Yep. Yeah, um, you can go to YouTube.com. You're not able to see it. 
I just I just see uh, I don't know about anybody else, but I just see uh, your icon. Yeah. You, what about no? It, it's showing that I'm sharing my screen. Oh, there we go. There we go. I can see it yeah. now. If you go to youtube.com, okay, you put C slash C and backslash C and then cloud data driven, you must be able to uh, just, uh, you know, join our channel. So when I upload it later, you will get notified. You could probably put a, a link to it in the, the, the comments for this event in Meetup as well. Wasn't this on Meetup? Yep. I will share. Yeah. I will share the video link uh, on Meetup and uh, on on uh, Eventbrite, and I will post about it on my LinkedIn profile as well. Yeah, great. And even on the user group, we do have uh, a user group on LinkedIn for this community. I will post it there. And the, right? Are there any more questions? No, not for me, anyways. And I'm sure that William's relieved by that, but. William, I just wanted to say thank you very, very much for taking the time to do this. This is uh, very serendipitous for me because I'm getting ready to, you know, submit a bunch of things to Pam. Good. The last one here. So yeah, great. Join Marcy in saying outstanding job. Thank you very much. Yeah, that was an excellent uh, presentation. I have a, any time when you present something, I always learn something new. Thank you, William. <laughs> yeah. Honored. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, everybody. Yeah, I yeah, appreciate that. Oh, perfect. Um, uh, guys, um, thank you so much. Um, uh, one more time, w William, for this wonderful presentation. And uh, thanks to all our attendees. Don't forget to follow us uh, and then share this meetup group uh, with your friends or peers. This session is being recorded. I will keep you posted later. Um, uh, one, one more time, thank you all. Have a good one. Enjoy thank your you, holiday. Please. You're welcome.